Hey, this is Ken Finnan from Capital Advantage Tutoring, and I'm here to help you pass the SIE exam. I've gone through chapters one through five, done them. I'm on to chapter six now, and we'll see if we can do it in one shot because it's not such a long chapter. This is a chapter called Investment Return. So that's what we're going to do here is work on the SIE exam, chapter six of the book, Investment Returns. So we're going to be covering return on investments, prices versus yield, cost basis, and capital events, measuring return and averages and index. Remember, this is for the SIE, so it's not all that deep, not a lot of math on this exam. Okay, so the first thing is equities and equity investments. If you have an equity investment, common or preferred, you get a dividend. If you have bonds, you get interest payments because you're lending the money and you're getting paid. But on equity, we're going to go here. So now, if you have common stock or preferred, you may or may not get dividends. If the company is making money and they want to pay dividends, they pay you a dividend, which is either cash or stock or even product, which is crazy, but they can't. If it's a preferred stock, it's always going to be cash. So when you talk about dividends, it's always quoted on a per share basis. So if you get a $1 dividend, it's $1 per share per year. And then if they just say a $1 dividend, I always assume it's a year. And then you see, they'll usually say quarterly 25 cents or quarterly 50 cents, which means you're getting 25 cents every quarter. So if it's a quarterly dividend of 25, that's a dollar a year. And that comes up later when we talk about yield. Now, there are four dates you have to worry about. Three of them are set by the company. One is set by FINRA based on settlement. So declaration date, that's the day they announce the dividend. Say it's June 1st is the declaration date. IBM is going to say we're declaring a dividend of 25 cents on June 1st. They declare it. They're going to say anyone who's owner of record on Thursday, June 25th. That's the record date. That's the day you have to be an owner of record to get the dividend which means you have to buy it two days before because we know that settlement is T plus two and to get on the record books, you have to get, you have to settle. So if the record dates Thursday, you have to buy it on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, boom, that's T plus two. Okay. So remember settlement is T plus two on stocks and preferreds, which are stocks. So if the record dates Thursday, you have to buy it by Tuesday. So the declaration date is the day we announce. The record date is the record, the day you must be owner of record, which means you have to have settled, be on the record books by then. Then the payable date is down the road. It's a couple of weeks later where they actually cut the check. It's not really a, I mean, we care because we want the money, but it's not really a calculation day. The question they're going to ask you all the time is when's the X day? The X day is the first day that you're not getting the dividend. Think ex-girlfriend, ex-wife, ex-husband, no wife, no girlfriend, no husband. So ex-dividend means no dividend. So if you buy stock, we're going back to this, Thursday is our record day. If you buy the stock on Wednesday, you settle on Friday, you're too damn late. But if you buy it on Tuesday, you settle on Thursday and you're on time. So Wednesday, the business day before the record date is the X day. Boom. So it goes declaration. We set the declaration, the record, and the payable. The X date is the day before. So I try to remember derp as the order. DERP, D-E-R-P, Declaration X, Record Payable. Payable is the day they cut the check. Good. Okay. So now the dividend is up to the board of directors. They have to announce it. That's who announces it on the declaration day. Now, we just talked about X dividend, so we're good. We, that's what I did in this thing. Now, understand something. So if you sell short stock and you do it around the X dividend day, there may be, if you don't deliver in time, the names are wrong. So the wrong person may get the dividend. You don't have to do the math on when it would or not. Just know that if the wrong person gets a dividend, like the short seller gets the dividend by mistake, they will get a due bill, which is saying, listen, you owe us that money, just give it back. So I'm a short seller, I sell it, I don't deliver on the right time frame, and I get the dividend when it's really supposed to be your dividend. Say I borrowed the stocks from you your firm will send me a due bill to send the dividend back. And I will, because it's part of the deal with the broker dealers. Okay. You can get a stock dividend. Understand a stock dividend is like a little mini split. So if you own a hundred shares at 50 and they do a 10% stock dividend, you will now own an extra 10%. So you will now own 110 shares, but then the price will drop too. So the easiest way I do it is if I own a hundred shares at 50, and there's a 10% stock dividend. 
I go, okay, I know that 100 times 50 is 5,000. That number will never change. That 5,000 won't change. So, mm, so a stock dividend, you don't pay taxes on that, but a cash dividend you do because you're getting money. Back to this, buy 100 shares at 50, that's worth five grand. Keep that in your head. Now, let's say we have a 10% stock dividend. You're going to do 100 times 10, that's 10, 10 shares. You now have 110 shares. You got an extra 10. Just do 5,000 divided by 110 and you get your new price. So you take the dividend, add the stock dividend, add it to your current value of shares, number of shares, then take the total value and divide it by that new number and you'll get it. That should be 45, 45. Do not take the value of the stock and subtract by 10%. The math doesn't work. Just trust me, it doesn't work. I had a long fight with one of my students once about it and I showed it to him that it doesn't work and he went with it and he passed, but it's not worth fighting about. So again, I get a stock dividend, 15% stock dividend. I own 100 shares. I now add 15 shares. I now own 115 shares. I take the original 5,000 divided by 115. Let me go from there. Okay, good. Now, current yield. If you see the word current yield, there's dividend yield and bond yield, but it's the same thing. Current yield is always this, is annual income, what you're getting every year, divided by the market price. That's what it is. So it's always annual income, whether it's interest or dividends, divided by the market price. That's my Reddit going on. So if I have a dividend, if they say, oh, you have a 25 cent dividend and the stock's trading at 50, you're going to do 25 cents times four, which is a dollar divided by 50, the market price, and that's going to work out to be a 2% yield. So again, I take the quarterly dividend. If it says quarterly, if they say annual, you're good. You don't have to do the extra math. Quarterly dividend, you take a 25 cent dividend, multiply it by four, that gives you a dollar. And if the common stock is 50 bucks, you get the price is $50. You go one over 50, that gives you 2%. It might come out as 0.02, but it's the same thing. Okay. Bonds, the same thing. So current yield on a bond is the same thing. It is a coupon. It is the annual income over the market price. No different than the stock. It's just it's interest, not um, not dividends. So a bond, if you buy a 5% bond, let's say you buy a 6% bond, okay? Let's say you buy a 6% bond and it's trading at 875. How do you do current yield? You know that $60, you're getting $60 a year because coupon is always percentage of par, like a 6% bond pays 60 4% bond pays 40, a 10% bond pays 100. That's not negotiable. So if you have a 6% bond, that's $60. And if the bond's trading at 875, you're going to do 60 divided by 875. And that's going to give you whatever number that is. I am not doing that math. But that's your current yield. It's always coupon or annual income over market price. Coupon over market price. Okay. That's current yield. Okay. So now remember, we've done this before, I think. You have a bond trading at a thousand. Say it's a five percent bond. Interest rates in the economy draw, go up to seven or eight percent. Your bond's still paying five, so it's much less attractive. The price will drop, and it is you doing so, the current yield will rise to almost match what's out there. So if yields go up, rates go up, your price goes down, and the current yield goes up. So yields and interest rates kind of go together. The price is opposite. So same thing, you have a 5% bond at 1,000, rates drop to 3%. Well, your bond looks awesome because it's paying 5 when everyone's paying 3. So people will pay more for that. The price will go up. And for other people, the current yield will go down. Remember, your yield doesn't change. Once you buy the bond or sell the bond, your yield is locked in. Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, now, remember, the, remember the, every book has a seesaw. You can do that. I'm not going to kill you on that. Just remember, if it's a discount, it's coupon, current, Yield to maturity, yield to call. If it's a premium, coupon, current, yield to maturity, yield to call. I use a triangle. Some people use a, a seesaw. It doesn't matter as long as you know that those rules are inviolable. So if you buy a bond at a discount, the current yield will be always higher than the coupon. The yield to maturity, maturity the yield to maturity will always be higher than the current, and the yield to call will always be higher than that. And if you're quoting it, you're going to quote it the worst of the two which means of yield to maturity or yield to call, you quote it the lower one. So on a discount, you quote yield to maturity. On a premium, say it goes coupon, current, yield to maturity, yield to call. Yield to call is the lowest, you quote it on yield to call. Okay. Another word, coupon and nominal mean the same thing. As far as this goes, nobody ever quotes anything at current yield. Another one is 
Yield to maturity or yield to call, most of the time yield to maturity might be called basis. Just remember basis is like your yield to maturity. That's the easiest way to think about this. Okay, move it on. We just did all this. I'm so fast at this. Okay, so yield to call. Think about this. So if you buy a bond at a discount at 800 and it's ten, it's a 10% bond at 800, you're getting 100 bucks a year. So that's your current yield. But if you hold it to maturity, you're also getting $1,000 at the end. So you're not only you're getting the you know the hundred bucks a year, you're also getting an extra two hundred dollars at the end. So that's going to bump your yield up because you're making more money. Because you oh remember bonds are always born apart and they die apart. So if you buy a bond at eight hundred, it's going to mature at a thousand. So at the end, you're getting a two hundred dollar little bonus that has to add to your yield because you're making more. And yield to call means you're doing it sooner, which means you're making that two hundred bucks faster. So it's higher. The opposite is if you buy a premium bond, say you pay twelve hundred, at the end you're only getting a thousand because that's the deal. So you pay twelve hundred, you get back a thousand. You're losing two hundred dollars if you hold it to maturity. So you're losing two hundred bucks, and you're getting a hundred bucks. So that's going to take away from your current yield, and that's why yield to maturity is lower than current because it, it builds in that loss, and yield to call is even lower than yield to maturity because it's building in that loss even faster. That's why it's lower. Okay. Okay, so what's cost basis? Cost basis, and again, this is bigger on the top offs than this. Cost basis is what you paid for something, okay? Cost basis is what you paid. Proceeds is what you sell it for. The difference is your capital gain or capital loss. Pro cal cost, save you by stock at 50 and it grows to 60. You paid 50, that's your cost basis. If you sell it at 60, that's your proceeds. The difference is your gain. But if you buy stock at 50 and it goes to 40 and you sell it, well, your cost basis is 50, your proceeds is 40, you have a $10 capital loss, okay? Now, always remember, whenever you put money in, when you get that back, you don't pay taxes on that. So if you buy stock at 50 and it grows to 60 and you sell it, well, the first 50 is your cost basis as you're getting back your capital that you put in. That's not taxable. The $10 is taxable. Now, remember, if you held that for more than a year, you pay a better tax rate. If it's a year or less, then you pay the higher ordinary income. Now, total return is your return plus or minus any income coming in. So it's going to be, you're not going to have to do this on the test, but get the concept. So again, you buy stock at 50, it goes to 60, and you have a $1 dividend. So you have a $10 gain plus a dollar that's 11 over the 50. That's total return. Total return counts the growth and any money. Now, if you paid money and you lost money in like for some reason, then that would affect it too. So total return is your total return. It counts your growth and your income that you get, and then you divide it by the original investment. That's total return. Probably wouldn't have to do it. Inflation adjusted is just, say it's called actual return, or they call it inflation or real. So you're going to take your actual return and minus inflation from it. So think about it. If you earn, if inflation is 3% and you earn 6%, you're really only 3% better because inflation is the prices are rising. So if you earn 6% a year, but price is going up by three, you're not making six. I mean, technically you're making six, but your actual in after inflation return is only three because you have to, it's everything costs more. So inflation adjusted return or real rate of return is going to be your actual return minus inflation. Probably not going to have to do this. Okay. A couple more things. The risk-free rate of return is basically T-bills. I mean, there's no risk. There's no default risk, no um, call risk, no interest rate risk, no no inflation risk, no reinvestment risk, none of these risks. So T-bills are like the base. They're going to have the lowest rate risk, but they also have the lowest return, okay? So the risk-free rate is basically your rate of return that there's no risk, and everything's going to be more than that, hopefully. If you're not even getting that, then you better have no risk, okay? Risk-adjusted return is basically how much – it's basically saying – it's, you're not going to have to do the return on this, but just saying you're adjusting your return based on how much risk you take. That's all it is. You will not have to do it. Just understand it. Now let's talk about the averages. So there's different kind of indexes. So there's the Dow Jones, which is the blue chips. It's the Dow 30. Those are the top 30 industrial companies in the world. It's a very narrow base. It's 30 stocks. It's the old company you've absolutely heard of. Um, then we have the transportation, which is like 20 stocks. You don't have to remember all these. Just get the concept. 
But the Dow Jones is the one that everyone quotes, but it's not the best. It's not the best range, uh, whatever you want to call it, of what's going on, because it's only the top 30 companies. I mean, they're massive companies. The Dow Jones transportation is all about transportation companies and utilities are the utilities. Just kind of know them. The S&P 500 is the one everyone quotes. It's 400 industrials, 20 transports, 40 financial, 40 utilities. Don't care about the breakup. Just know that it's a very broad based and it's very broad and it gives a much better indication of where the market is. That's what people who know what they're doing use the S&P, not the Dow. The Dow looks good and it's easy to understand, but the S&P 500 is what most people use. Okay. Then there's a New York Stock Exchange Index, which is just basically all stocks on the stock exchange. The Wilshire is almost everything. It's like the Wilshire 5,000, but it really has like 6,300 stocks on it. It covers everything. Things on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. I mean, there's so many stocks. It's the broadest, but nobody uses it because it counts crappy companies and good companies and everything. So it's very broad. Okay. Um, then if you're, I'm not going to go into the crazy stuff, but basically when you when you're doing a portfolio and you're comparing to see how well you do, you have to compare it to an index that relates. So if you're doing equities, you do an equity index. If you're doing bonds, you're going to do a bond index. If you're doing munis, which are bonds, you're going to do a municipal index. You have to track it versus an index that that relates to what you're doing. Okay. That's it. That's chapter six. I can't believe I got it done in only 17 minutes. Please like, subscribe, and let's go. Chapter seven next.